Giants, huge dub. Big no, one. No way around it. They're very close to having three in a row. If they, if they were it. a little bit better against Dallas, they would have three Needed in a row. Needed it, I think. Um, Brian Dable era. I lo- I like Brian Dable a lot, but it feels like we're on life support at this point. So this was a huge step in his direction to defending, obviously keeping his job and getting New York uh, going in the right direction because I do still think he's a good coach. It's just been a bad situation over the last couple of couple of years. 29-20 to 20 is the final score in this one. So let's talk about the Giants' top five graded players first. Quarterback Deontay Banks at the top of this list with an 84.6. Uh, offensive guard Greg Van Roten with a 82.2. Wide receiver Terry Slayton picking up the slack with no Malik Neighbors in this game. 76.9. Offensive tackle Jermaine Illuminor with a 76.7. Cornerback Cordell Flott with a 74.2. And then Daniel Jones with a 70.4. On Seattle side of things, linebacker Terrell Dodson with an 83.0. Linebacker Jerome Baker next with a 72.3. Tyler Lockett, their wide receiver with a 70.5. Jerron Reed with a 70.1. And then edge rusher Derek Hall with a 69.2. Geno Smith in this one, a 70.0. Stat that told the story here for the Giants' big win. All right, this is getting wrapped in with my most disappointing. Go ahead. All right, I'm gonna, let me set the stage. The Please. Seattle Seahawks lead the NFL in rushing grade. Okay? okay. The Seattle Seahawks are 28th in the NFL in pass protection grade. Okay? Okay. Geno Smith, over the last two years was the NFL's highest graded deep passer, all right? Okay. Now I'm going to give you a second set of things. Okay. And context, we're playing the Giants, who admittedly have a really good defensive line, right? Lawrence. In theory. Burns, Thibodeau. They're top eight or ten in pass rush grade, that whole bit. In theory. Okay. Because at the beginning of the year, they were not. They're getting there. They're better. They're running running hot now. Dexter Dexter Lawrence is a monster. I'll get to that in a second. And Seattle's pass pro is a problem. Uh, Yeah, I'll get to that later as well. The Seahawks called seven run plays this entire game. Wow. They Wouldn't have thought that. They called seven run, running plays the entire game. Would not have thought that. And they called only three play-action passes the entire game. Why? And, <laughs> okay, they called five screens in this game. Eh, two, like two of them worked. Okay. And, okay, so maybe, <laughs> maybe you're dropping back and chucking the ball with Geno Smith, right? <laughs> Geno Smith's average depth of target was 5.3 yards. His lowest... Uh, so this is just an against-the-script game for them. Against it. They burned it. Well, yeah. I, don't know what, I don't know what the script was. This, this, was, this was improv. This was whose line is it anyway. I don't know what this was. <laughs> great show. Ooh, great, legendary show. This, that's Geno's lowest average depth of target since week 9 of 2022. I'd believe it. So I would believe it. We don't feel like running the ball and we don't feel like chucking it deep because even though we have Geno and Metcalf and all these guys and we don't feel like calling play action to at least make him think we're running the ball I I really like Ryan Grubb as an offensive coordinator I think he's done a great job at least through the first four weeks and he was awesome at Washington I don't know what was going on in this game because I'm watching this and I'm like where wait what why are we not running then I get the Giants D line is good but what I don't know what the plan was here. I, they called seven run plays the entire game. In a game, they were not down three scores in this game. They were within seven points like this entire game. And they called seven run plays the whole game and three play-action passes. And it wasn't one of those things where it's like, oh, let's throw early and set up the run and unload the box and, you know, run into a light box and set it up. No, there was just like, nah, Kenneth Walker, take the day off. It five carries. Like, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, and I it, don't either. It felt like earlier in the year... Didn't we get like one really good day from Zach Charbonnet too? Charbonnet's played well, right? Yeah. He's played. They lead the league. They, even with the three of them, Gino and Walker and Charbonnet, they lead the league in rushing grade. And I know the O line's not great, especially in the interior. And even with a backup right tackle, I get it. You can't just not do it if you're choosing to be one dimensional in what was a close game. That they walked into this game with zero faith they could block the Giants. Not even didn't even give themselves a puncher. Well, a they puncher. did. Well, they didn't. Well, they didn't. But I go. If you're one-dimensional and they're going to tee off on you because they know you're trying to play seven on seven, well, they're going to tee off on you. You're, you're, I'm surprised they wouldn't they wouldn't run the ball more because that's my staff that told the story or, is the Giants' defensive least, line. At least chuck it deep to set it up. Geno's got a five-yard average depth of target. Right. I don't know what low. I don't know what this plan was. Lawrence Burns and Thibodeau all had passes win percentages above ten in this game. They had seven sacks as a team. Well, they so knew what was they knew what it. was coming. Every player on the offensive line for the Seahawks allowed a pressure in this game. 
four sacks were credited, four of the seven sacks were credited against the offensive line specifically. I didn't realize this. You know, you, you mentioned it, and I'm just kind of like piggybacking off it. 33.8 pressure percentage this season. It's fourth highest in the NFL. Did not realize the Seahawks offensive line was that bad at pass protection. It's that bad last year. Oh, yeah. It's been, and now they're trying to fix it with guys like Lake and Tomlinson, and, and now you're getting. Um, Tomlinson actually had the second highest grade. Not, not right. <laughs> of any of them. That's a problem. Well, which is fine. I, I, Abraham Lucas is hurt. I, I, like, yeah. I, I understand. Yeah. I, I understand the quick passing thing. But if you're playing two things to beat a great D line like that, play with tempo, run the football. Mm -hmm. Choosing not to run the football, you make those guys' lives real easy. Dexter Lawrence doesn't have to worry about an A gap or nothing like that. He don't got to worry about nothing. I'm just okay, I guess we'll pin our ears back for 60 minutes. I, I, don't, I don't understand. Now I, now I get why the Seahawks didn't score but 13 points on offense because I, I don't know what the plan was. And it's nothing it, – it didn't look like anything like this in the first four weeks. I, I don't know what they were – it's like they came into this game so scared of this Giants D-line that they just said, like, no, we're just going to not even – bother with it I, I don't I have mm -hmm. no idea what the plan was I'm gonna shout out Tyrone Tracy is my most impressive though because that was my stat that told the story most disappointing but Tyrone Tracy definitely gave the Giants something to something to look forward to throughout the rest of the season on the ground Devin Singletary gets hurt in this game so Tracy comes in 18 carries 129 rushing yards and a 76.1 rushing grade that alone could be great right those stats alone could be enough to say like hey a most impressive in this game this stat impressed me even more about Tyrone Tracy. Four explosive plays of 10 yards or more when it came to rushes on the ground. Three of them came on first and 10. First and 10. Love You're it. starting to drive. You're starting to set it down. You're handing the ball off. This guy's getting you a first down immediately after that. And more. And then the other one, the fourth explosive run, came on a third and two. Oh, okay, third down. We're barely picking up the first down. Just kidding. Now we're getting. Now I'm getting more than 10 on you. Tracy gives them the ability to be dynamic. And it's why I said at the beginning of the year, Tyrone Tracy will eventually be the starting running back of this team in his rookie season because he gives you juice that Singletary doesn't. Is he going to screw up more than Singletary in the little things? Yes, because he's a rookie and Singletary's a vet playing with a coach that he knows. But this is evidence that this guy allows you to be dynamic. And especially on a day where you did not have Malik Neighbors, they needed this. And Tyron Tracy was able to show you exactly what he's going to be able to do at the NFL level. So I thought the timing of those four explosive plays, three of them coming on first and 10, very impactful. Very impactful, especially when it comes to leading long drives and everything like that. So he was the most impressive for me. Who was the most impressive for you? Another young guy for him. I'll go with a second-year guy. The top of that top five, we had Deontay Banks at corner. This is a guy I've watched a lot of tape on last year and this year, and this was his best game yet. Five targets, two catches, 17 yards allowed, three forced incompletions, 90.3 coverage grade. And the one thing I was frustrated with last year when he would have some rough games is they way too often – ask him to do too much press man against the other team's best receiver like like the Darrell Rivas assignment and I'm like why why are we doing this like oh, this is a lot of pressure on such a young kid who needs some work like he could be a really good football player I do think he's a really good football player they asked him to do so much and there was samples of it last year where that when they had him in zone coverage it's pretty darn good okay this year same thing there are times I noticed you know the best example the, the CeeDee Lamb touchdown last week, who was one-on-one -on -one press man against CeeDee Lamb, Deontay Banks. And it was, this was a theme last year, I'm telling you. They, when they don't ask him to do that sort of thing, okay, he's, they're, not a man, like, they're not a man coverage team. I thought that's why they hired Shane Bowen and, and got rid of Wink, Wink Martindale is because, okay, we're going to play more zone coverage. We're going to use our eyes and our instincts more, right? This year, Deontay Banks in man coverage, 32.3 coverage grade. In zone coverage, 78.2. They they just need to work to the strengths of their team, and this guy's going to be really darn good. He's a good football player. The more that they lean into zone coverage, they're not a man coverage team. And they lost Xavier McKinney, the center fielder, who we're going to get into in about two and a half minutes here. This is what they need. This is the blueprint. All three of those forced incompletions, zone coverage. Deontay Banks can be really good. Use him right. I love the Deontay Banks shout-out because I think he's a really talented football player. Uh, I already talked about how Seahawks offensive line was my most disappointing. Do you have a most disappointing that you didn't mention? It's, it's just Ryan Grubb and that whole whatever was, oh, going, sure. whatever okay. was yep. going on Fair. on offense. Fair. That entire picture. <laughs>